genocide, it's all about terror, fear, sexual violence. Anyone who might have pointed out the fact that most people in Germany get home every evening unharmed would have presumably been locked up for lacking the necessary level of hysteria. Hysteria has become the normal state of things. When those hysterics say there are no solutions, only more anxiety they feel affirmed by increased anxiety. Most people in Germany get home every evening unharmed would have presumably been locked up for lacking the necessary level of hysteria. Hysteria has become the normal state of things. When those hysterics say there are no solutions, only more anxiety they feel affirmed by increased anxiety. Wolfgang Schäuble, instead of working things to calm, working to calm things down, started talking after Cologne about the possibility of deploying the army. Anything less wouldn't have been hysterical enough. Only when everyone in the country is running around like scared chickens does the hysteric feel satisfied. He keeps asking, how could someone who doesn't speak German could ever work here? As if there was no answer in the German past. The whole hysterization is now known as discussing integration. Anyone not hysterical about the topic simply doesn't get it yet. Thank you for that. Sounds a little familiar. <laughs> in ways, um, and we're gonna kind of touch on those parallels uh, throughout the conversation. But I wanna, I wanna start by asking you uh, to kind of explain to, to us, in your own words, how do you consider your voice as, as an author, as a columnist, as a playwright? Um, it, it, describe what you consider your, your voice. Well, it's different voices, I'd say. I would say like there are multitudes in me, as a woman would like to say. I mean, I do have a very poetic voice, like when my publisher and editor said, I mean, I can't believe that the lady writing for newspapers is the lady who's writing my stories that I lecture, so edit. Um, I feel like I do have um, very distinct voices, depending on what, what experiences you take hold grip of. But um, the political voice has somehow become stronger in the last years due to, I think, I feel like I do have some role in, in this country that um, an artist has a capability of expressing things in another way. So finding my voice as an op-ed writer was something very different. And I, I think I range somewhere between funny, analytical, provocative. It's always trying to find the nerve that would maybe um, be hidden so far, or steer a discussion that wasn't loud enough so far. So when I wrote this article about Merkel, it was one of the most successful articles they had this year. It's one of the three most read on, on their online um, pages. So I do think I sit at home, ironically, um, alone and wonder about what would be the thing I would like people to discuss at home when they read it, and what would I um, like them to yeah, be worried about, or be angry about, or be happy about. So I try to be easier than in the normal general German tone. We are sometimes too serious in newspapers, so I like to take a little Bob Dylan into the tone of my voice. And um, yeah, so I'm finding and searching for how to be a public voice in a political discourse when you're not a scientist or something. Sure, I'm wondering how has that transition been? I mean, has it been seamless in ways from artist to political voice, even activist in, in some ways? What's that transition been like for you? Did, have you noticed it happening? I think it was always there because my very first article was actually, was called um, like um, intervening for a second. You know, that was my type of character. I wanted to intervene for a second and then rush away and let the people handle it. So that's maybe what I want to do, just put some arguments in the discourse cause some debate and not always be there to solve the problems, maybe. That's the political work, but I do like to intervene for a second. Stir the pot a little yeah. bit and then, yeah, yeah. sure. That's, a, that's an important role. Um, so it seems to me, given your experience, your background, your upbringing, um, I'm, I'm curious, did, did you seek out this political, you know, activism or political involvement? Or do you think in some ways it sort of sought you out? It, it, you said it, it's always been there in some ways. Was it the refugee policies and, and, and the, the migrant sort of crisis, as we've heard in the news, um, that sort of activated that, you think, in some ways for you? 
Well, I think it was always there because I grew up in a household that was very political, not because they were so well educated, but because they were simply very affected by everything politicians decided. So I have a working class family, and my father was somebody who was very aware of justice, history, and he loved to watch all those documentaries about what the history of the world and all the century events. He knew all the politicians, though he was not actually a well-educated man. So as a kid, I watched him being so um, obsessed with news and so caring about all the injustice everywhere in the world. And I still felt when I went, I went out to be a writer that I didn't want to touch this point. I still felt like I am somehow a foreigner in Germany. I am a guest because my parents were guest workers, so how could I go there and be unfriendly to my guests, to the hand that was feeding me? All these things that you had in your mind. Um, till I found out that even my stories became apolitical in terms of my characters were never set anywhere. I wrote about feelings, I wrote about things, but I never placed them anywhere because I was afraid that the German society would place them as something exotic. So when my characters turned out to be like nowhere placed, nowhere named, they just were feelings. And then I figured out I, I did not have access to my own story and couldn't write real stories in fiction because I would deny my own story in the German uh, literary world. And in finding out that I was silencing my own experiences, I figured out that the biggest tribute I can do to German society to make it a real democratic society is to bring that to the public narrative. Like to give my stories as a part of the German story and not as a part of the immigrant story only, but as immigration being a part of the German story. And that's when I started to realize if I don't work on a change in that society, nobody will ever read my stories as German stories. So in a way, I was fighting for the language I live in to be part of the stories I have to tell. Mm. Part of the fabric of the nation yeah. from, its, from its inception. Um, you just mentioned the concept of guest worker, um, and I've, I've read you talk about this um, several times. Um, that's obviously something that resonates here in the US. We hear a lot during this election in particular about migrant labor, uh, about um, documented and undocumented workers and the role that they play in our, in our country and in our economy. Um, talk a little bit about the, the German concept of guest worker. Uh, and both of your parents were guest quote unquote guest workers when you were growing up? Yeah, I, I accept the word, I accept the word. <laughs> Many Germans like to like retell a better past, mm -hmm. so they say don't call them guest workers. But then again, my parents have adopted it. It is part of our history, so why should I make past more beautiful than it was? So I tend to call them guest workers, and they call themselves like that. And the, the concept was mutually agreed to say so. My parents didn't come to Germany to stay there. My parents came to Germany to live there for some years and go back to Croatia and have a better life, uh, Yugoslavia then. And um, so Germany was, in, uh, 60 years ago, started to um, acquire labor from other European countries that were not so well off the tent, did not have the industry that Germany had, and Germany had to rebuild itself after the Second World War. So much of the labor was recruited in other European countries like Italy, Greece, Spain, and so on. And my parents, because Tito, if you remember Tito and Yugoslavia, he did not manage to give work to all his people, but he wanted to have the myth of I'm taking care of them. So he took care of them by selling them out and giving them to Germans to take care of them. So it was um, quite an ironic thing about the socialism that Tito created that half of his people live outside of Croatia now because they had to go abroad to work. And my parents always lived a provisoric life, if I can say so. So I was never grown up with the fact that my life is my life, but that my life is like something, um, a state I live in before I live my own life. It was a very awkward feeling. It's like you live in a country, you feel you're the guest worker, your parents are, and you have not that bad a life because we did have a pretty good success in terms of social, um, how do you say, um, a social rising in the social class. My parents were very successful in terms of the American dream. They came there, they worked, we were provided with a very good education, so we actually made dreams, certain dreams come true and had to bury others. So that's the dialectic of this life. And um, I think till the war in Yugoslavia, we grew up with the feeling that our life has yet to start one day when we go back. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the war started in Croatia that we figured out, oh, maybe that's never going to happen. And what was so interesting about the moment when the war started in Yugoslavia was it was the same moment 
when the wall in Berlin fell. So having families, we were one of the biggest immigrant communities in Germany back then, to figure out, you know, Germany is like the end of Cold War, we have peace, at the same time you have your own family in Croatia being shattered by war. So this whole dialectic between the ones celebrate unity and peace and a better world, and the others like break into pieces and fight wars, um, was kind of irritating. I, I wrote about that in my novel, Restaurant Dalmatia. And what was so crucial about that moment, I think, for all the immigrants in Germany was that they lost any belonging because they did not share the experience with the people in Yugoslavia. They were watching the war in the news. And yet they were not part of the German Union because Germans were focused on their own experience and on the East experience, but not on the immigrant experience. Almost very feeling nationless. Right, right, almost nationless. And your story it did not really matter. You know, the Germans were looking for the big novel about the fall of the Berlin Wall, but nobody asked about the immigrant perspective. So I think if you ask me how or why did I think I was called into activism, was because I said, hey, listen, you know, there's, there was one comedian, a Turkish man, who when he made a joke about when the Berlin Wall fell and he saw the first German from, from the East, he said, hi, we were there before you. So who is so who's more German in this, um, in, in, in this story? Uh, let's go back to the, your most recent book, Made in Germany, uh, What is German in Germany? Are you German? In Germany? Do you, do you consider yourself German in Germany to others? Well, depending on my state of mind, I have different answers to that. I feel like sometimes I don't want to claim to be German at all. There's this great German uh, critic with Jewish, Jewish descendant, uh, Marcel Reichranitzky, who said, I will never do them the favor to say I'm German. Yeah, so there is certainly like one thing, why do you want to claim an identity somebody really doesn't want to give you or allow you to have? On the other hand, just by saying, yes, I am German, you, because in terms of provocation, you do provoke certain people, not everybody. And then there's other people who want you to say you're German, because they're like, you know, you don't have anything to do with Croatia. It's like your parents came here, but you were born here, so you're actually German. And I say, yes, I am, but I'm also Croatian. And then they're like, but you have to pick. You have to, be. like, you know, I feel like, well, I can't pick, because it's both there, it's simply there. You can't pick things that are simply both there. Yeah, and so you, you engage in these identity talks with other people and what's interesting is that always other people want to define you. And what's a little sad about it all is that for my generation, I'm the second generation born in Germany. I was not born in Croatia. And um, so actually if you figure out that you are always out-calculated somehow, that they never allow you to be simply German, even with all the new and other traits that you have in, in your Germanness, that makes you angry to a certain aspect. Not with me, because I can I feel like I can do whatever I love, but then the, this book is a lot about the second and third generation of boys who grow up in Germany and live sort of certain cliches that they think they have left in Germany, like they can only be the ghetto boys or the angry boys or the hip-hop boys and not the educated or the one who ruled the country or the one who made politics. And there's only certain biographies available for them. Right. And this generation actually, sometimes I call them like they are um, children without parents, without anything, because the country denies their heritage and at the same time doesn't give them their German identity. So I feel that they are somewhere nowhere. And I, am, I do feel that we have to fight for a new Germanness where these kids feel just perfectly German and fine on the way they are. Do you, how important, um, maybe to you personally or, or to others with a so-called immigrant history, um, immigrant background, uh, how important is it to self-identify as something, as German, as American, as Croatian, Yugoslavian? Um, is there a certain power or a certain validation that comes from being able to to self-identify, or do you find that it's more powerful to say, I'm, I'm just me, and, and I don't need your label or your uh, definition? Well, it depends on the context. It can be very fancy to say, it's just me, I don't care. Yeah. On the other hand, we are in a situation where people, you know, we, we have a refugee crisis, people flee their countries, and then they arrive somewhere, and they don't have papers, and they are denied a normal life. 
So I think it's also ridiculing other people to say, you know, I don't care about my identity, I just have a passport and I don't care. But I have a lot of privileges due to my passport. And I have a certain life due to the citizenship I am acknowledged or not. And what always um, bothered me was that this first generation of guest workers, they never were citizens. So they lived a apolitical life and were never a political force. So though we now have 20 million Germans with a non-native German background, these people were never the target for political rhetorics, political programs or political parties. So anything that makes you a citizen and that gives you the feeling you are shaping a country, you are contributing to a country, the politics are making politics for you too. It never happened to them. And it was Chancellor Kohl who actually said and always uh, repeated, this is not an immigrant's country. This is not an Einwanderungsland. So he reassured the people with a native German background that nothing is going to change no matter how many million people come. But it was his political party who made a politics of immigration because he needed it for the economy. So it's actually very funny that the political party who was not open to change the identity politics of its country was the one who brought all those people in. And at the moment, I think we are experiencing a crisis because too many Germans have been reassured for too long that nothing changes, though many people enter our country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, speaking of politics, um, let's kind of segue into um, what is certainly a politically tumultuous time we're living in right now. Um, it's quite honestly a, an unprecedented presidential election. Um, nothing seems quote unquote normal anymore. Um, nothing seems out of bounds. Um, it, I'm curious, in, in Germany, as an observer, of course, it seems as though there's been this pendulum. And uh, sort of on one end, the country really, at, at Merkel's uh, request and leadership, opening its borders, saying, if not us, then who, type of mentality. Um, and over time, the pendulum is swinging back in, in the opposite direction in, in many ways, in terms of maybe a pendulum of public opinion. Um, how, how do you observe that shift uh, as a citizen of Germany, as an author, as a, as a citizen of the world? Um, and as a concerned citizen, it strikes me. Um, has that been a tangible shift for you? Is there a moment where, where you said, "Okay, we may have this. This may have gone a little too far," or, you know, uh oh. Well, we were talking about my voice, and I think something that I really, really care about when I articulate myself publicly is to not add to the concern of people, because so many people are so concerned and living in the best part of the world that it's sometimes I'm sorry, it is ridiculous. So I do respect their fears and I do, but I try to stay positive. It's like when I, when I, what I said in this book is that all that Merkel did by saying yes we can is to say yes we can handle this, yes we are strong, yes we can do things, yes we have a role in this world to play, yes we are a, let's say somehow more rich country than others and we can bear that responsibility. And then all these people turn crazy. And how do you work against those people turning crazy in the public voice? So what I um, found very funny was um, we, we always forget when we talk about the public opinion. There seems some idea that the public opinion is there. On the other hand, in Germany, there's 9 million people who help voluntarily, who do all the work to manage to integrate the refugees who came last year people who don't form the public opinion because they go to doctors and they're not in the news because they help people bring their children to the hospital and get, I mean, they help with the everyday organization of what we have been, uh, what we have been through the last year. Um, what, bo what bothers me is that the political debate has given voices to people who portray a picture of the life like it's not. You know, because when we have the talk shows, you have people who talk about a country and I feel like this is not the country I live in. These people are old and scared and they don't like to shape my country and I'm, I live another life. So I feel that nothing is represented because I know so many German people who are great, 
who was as I was sitting in Barcelona at a table at the table and people next table and normally I hate listening to Germans when I'm abroad because you feel like you want to have some time off. But then these but then these guys were so nice. I mean they just sat there and they're you know you get all these bad images about how the refugees are, but then we help them and they're so great and we know good people. So all those good stories, it's like with, with guest workers. We are actually a story of success. 20 million people now have a non-native German background. There has never been an immigrant policy and there are so many successful stories in terms of being part of the country, shaping the country, helping the economy, but it's never told. We talk about 3% that are problematic. And how, how so I think that that resonates here, and, and I'm sure that um, many of you appreciate sort of a positive um, tone when talking about this, because we have been so, I think, barraged with, um, with negativity and, and hateful rhetoric um, throughout the campaign uh, cycle. Um, but so how, how do we, as a, as a society, mitigate that very strong, loud voice of maybe um, concern or fear or hysteria and, and elevate maybe the less, the, the more timid voice of people who are actually living their life and getting work done every day and maybe don't have time to act hysterically or speak hysterically or well I think the media can do a lot it's about you who you have like the the multipliers or whatever you can make yeah. a single story big mm -hmm. you can tell the story that works out and not only the story that scares people mm -hmm. it's like when when we had these people marching in the east every Monday there were 20,000 people and everybody reported about it all the time and then there were things in Munich going on with 30,000 people celebrating a diverse society, uh, refugees welcome politics. That was like a little thing, you know, they're just celebrating. You know, so what is the big thing in this society? What, um, and, and then on the other hand, how do you present the facts? Germany has turned hysterical about the fact that 890,000 people came to Germany last year. They could and should be hysterical about the fact that we don't know who entered. I think that was a mistake Merkel made, that she did not somehow register the people. She could say, I want to be a humanitarian politician, but let me register the people. She didn't do that. So this makes her politics very vulnerable. And on the other hand, um, to speak about 62 other million people who are actually living in poverty, in hunger, in war, it's so easy to just focus on your little navel and say, you know, but this, you know, now I have like 100 refugees in my neighborhood and maybe I don't like how they look and maybe I don't, I don't, I don't. You know, it's like people just turn dark and they don't open their minds and see, okay, maybe I will have to handle a person that I'm not used to. Maybe that person will bring something new and great to my life too. And on the other hand, not forget that we have 28 million children in poverty, fleeing war, and somehow put your own experience to perspective. I think it's important to remind the people that we live in a world and not in a neighborhood, though we experience our neighborhood every day. Uh, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit um, because you just reminded me of, um, uh, anecdotally, briefly, yesterday before I met you, um, I spent a little bit of time at in a, in a church basement in Lowell, uh, which is a suburb of, of, of Boston, um, a smaller city than Boston, um, and it was packed with refugees from Sudan, Congo, Syria, Afghanistan, Iran, you name it, eight or nine different languages being spoken, and um, there were children, there were mothers, there were fathers, um, and they were interacting with people who were donating winter clothing to them. And there was no question of there, there was no side-eye glare of, you know, what is your intention here in this country? There was no um, wondering about your level of education or what you're going to do as for a job here in this culture. It was at its basic level, humans helping humans. And it was, for, for a journalist who's covering this topic throughout the election, it's, it was a, a reprieve. It was a simple um, experience. And it strikes me as though 
those simple experiences are so powerful at the, at the individual human level, but they often get lost in these labels that we have to, or, or bureaucracies need to label some people. So you're a refugee, or you're an asylee, or you're an immigrant, or you're a documented or undocumented worker. Um, do you see the, the, the sort of what's lost in those labels that it, we lose the sort of individuality of a topic of immigration when we when we refer to this as the refugee crisis yeah we, we lose the individuality and we also lose the fact that we actually have universal human rights it's like with these labels we somehow forget that they are just as human as we are and in germany we have this wonderful law that says like the dignity of a human being is untouchable and there's many people who say it's not the dignity of a German, but the dignity of a human being. And that is a law that was um, written after the Second World War out of a reality where people know what people can do to each other. So that we have to learn to see our, each other as humans first. And how to tell that, I mean, how to bring it back to a single story and make world politics and make bureaucracy I do understand the dialectic, and I would still like to somehow defend bureaucracy in certain aspects, because while working for the city of Heidelberg, I had a lot of insight of what's going on behind the doors, and I saw a lot of bureaucrats doing, like actually managing things. They did what Merkel asked for. They actually did the yes we can thing. They organized that people would not live in ghettos, but they like gave, um, organized a decentralized um, way of living for refugees. So every neighborhood had the feeling, okay, it's some people I can manage. It's not all of them with us, but only some, and I can get to know the people I get to know. And I felt like bureaucracy can do a lot to do things good. And it should be also an, a duty of the civic society to remind the bureaucrats that they have the capacity to do their best. So I think it's also our job to work into the attitude of bureaucracy to understand was it what is it the citizens want? And if the citizens give the city, the state, the feeling we want this to work out, then things do work out. Um, but on the other hand, the conflict is so big, so the threat for the people to be responsible for all the world conflicts is simply too much. So we also have to acknowledge that. You can be compassionate about the single story but maybe you can't silence the fear about the 62 million people displaced. And not everybody feels that he can, has enough strength left to f help 62 million people. So I think what we do have to learn is to think both on a global politic level and on the individual level, like what of all this, I mean, what of these things is really concerning us? What is really scaring us? Um, what can we do here? And what can we demand of our politicians to do on the world Political level, yeah, it's a delicate balance. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so you mentioned to me. And there's one thing about the single story. Just to, to have a beautiful example in Germany, we have this um, this myth that uh, like we have to force them to learn the language, and they're not going to want to integrate. They want to live in their little uh, tribal stuff, and they don't care. And um, I was when Germany started with all this organizing the crisis, um, which is now um, sort of not necessary because we have far less refugees coming in. Yeah. Um, we built centers, first arrival centers, and this should be the centers where people would be registered. And in Heidelberg we had, in the former American bases, where we had five to 6,000 people at the highest peak levels who we had to register and somehow then decide where in Grand Rittenbeck they would go to. And when I was visiting that place, I stood in front of a house and there were like mothers and children and they were yelling and crying and such. I was like, oh God, what's going on there? So I just left, I went there and asked what's going on. And there were Germans um, uh, like saying, you can't enter this building. No, it's full, it's full. And I was, what's going on in there? And they said, there's German courses in there. And the kids were crying because they wanted to go to class. And the mothers were crying because they wanted their kids to learn the language. And they all came with the fact, you know, if we want to come here, if we want to have a life here, then we have to learn this, the language even during this registration process. They were eager to learn the language. And um, I just thought this is something that we never get told by the media. It's always a fear of they're not going to integrate. 
but then there were all these bunch of kids and mothers who were like, you know, we want to be in that course, and there was no space for them. Right. Right. I'm going to sort of pick up on the, even even using the word crisis mm -hmm. strikes me as an interesting and, and sort of loaded way in writing some of these questions and in doing some reading and, and, and just kind of following the topic. I was trying to search for a word to use other than crisis because it that it strikes me as a loaded word. I, I wonder what you think about that, and and if there is another word, you know, influx of refugees, or I, I mean, it's what are your thoughts on that? Because language is powerful. Language is very powerful. Yeah, but I do think we have a crisis. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. but I mean, no, 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 no. <laughs> by all I, means, do, by I all think means. the problem is what 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 is the crisis about, yeah. and that's what we argue about. Some people say the refugee is the crisis, because if he just stayed away, he would have no refugee crisis. Then other people say it's a solidarity crisis. So if we had more solidarity, there would be less crisis. You know, what is actually the crisis that we talk about?